For this next song, uh, we will actually need our friends who joined us at VBS, our small friends, to come up and dance if you would like. Um, we need some help with emotion, some help with the song. So please come up if you're comfortable. We'd love to see your happy, smiling faces up here uh, showing us how to do this. to come with, so y'all come on up. Okay, listen. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Sarah Harrison. I come here with my husband Tom and my two children, Teddy and Abby, and we've been here a little over a year. Thank you for being brave and coming down. First, before we start, let's take a posture of prayer and invite Jesus to join us. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are good, and you have good for us today. Open our ears to hear and our heart to listen to what you have to say. May my words be only what you want me to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I need a reader. Who can read? Who's going to be brave? No. Okay, come here, Mom. We're going to read Hebrews 11.6. We're going to go right down here. It starts with and. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near her to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Great. Thank you so much. Good job, Mo. Okay, so who was with me a few weeks ago at VBS? We had so much fun. And on our first day, we talked about the prophet Elijah and how he experienced God in two very different ways. One was super wild, where they had the altar that they drenched with water and the fire came down from heaven and boom! Everyone saw God was real in a very big way. And then Elijah was in the wilderness later on, all alone and whisper, whisper. God was so quiet. So he heard God very different ways, didn't he? 
But you and me, just normal kids and people, how can we experience God? I have a few ideas. Are you guys ready? Okay, here's the clue for idea number one. This is something we used in my house. We'd gather around the piano and we would, what do you think this is? A song. We would sing. <gasps> guys, God has given us voices and musical ability. When we use that to sing and make music to praise God, <gasps> it makes him smile. And we experience the joy of the Lord. Way number two. Here's your clue. Look around at each other, and it's a big Christian word that starts with the letter F. Anyone know it? Close. Fellowship. Christian fellowship. Big word. Here's what it means. We're doing life together as Christians. We're encouraging each other, helping each other, sharing, learning about Jesus, singing songs. And guess what? We're sharing the loving kindness of God and experiencing it through each other. Way number three. I need you to see past the Lego. I know some of you are Lego lovers as we are in our house. And what do we have? A tree. Nature. Who is so happy when they go outside swimming, biking, hiking, playing at the playground. Oh, I love being outside. And God made the mountains and the valleys. God made the lakes and the seas. He made the land animals and the sea creatures for us to enjoy. He said it was good. So when we go outside and we play and experience nature, we experience God's goodness. Way number four. Now we have the Sunday school answer, so everyone should get it right, okay? Here's one you may have. Here's another one. The Bible. Oh, what a gift. God gave us his word. He gave us the Bible. And you know what he said? Read it and obey it because he knows when we read this, like every day because it's good for us and when we obey it we're going to stay on the right path so through god's word that is a hundred percent true every bit of it we experience god as our wise guide he will guide us down the right path the last way and i'm going to show it to you in sunday school we take a posture of Prayer. Prayer. So in Sunday school, we pray this way. We can also pray in a group as we did when we started. Do you guys know how I love to pray? I wake up really early and my house is super quiet. And sometimes I talk to God out loud because no one else is around. Sometimes I think words in my head and I know God hears me. Sometimes, I like to write God a letter. Adults call it journaling. But you can write God a letter, or you can draw him a picture, or paint him a, paint him a picture to show him the highs and the lows of your day, and how you're feeling, and he cares. How else can we pray? You know how else we can pray? Super easy. So maybe you're going, to school and you walk into the lunchroom and your friends didn't save you a seat and you all of a sudden feel kind of lonely and you say, God, I feel alone, be near me. That's it, you can say it in your head and he hears you. <gasps> or maybe last night you heard some thunder, like we did, and you can say, God, I feel kind of scared but you're bigger than the thunder. Help me to not feel scared. Or, your mom says, clean your room. And for me as an adult, it's that laundry is staring you down. And I say, Lord, I'm feeling kind of grumpy. I don't like laundry. But you 
can help me change my heart because I can fold the laundry as if I'm folding it for God. And you can have a heart change too. So when we pray, we experience God's faithfulness. So all these are ways we can experience a very real God as a very normal child. Thank you guys for being such good listeners. Now you can go back to your families or you can head back to Sunday school and adults, we get to practice fellowship and turn around and meet our neighbors. Thank you. attended teen camp, that they would be influencers for Christ in our church and in their communities. Um, pray for the recovery from the typhoon that hit Taiwan recently, um, and also pray for God's people to be a light during cleanup and repair. And then praise God for Chris and Michelle's arrival back in Thailand, and then pray for the participants coming for their training next week, and the instructors and mentors to have good preparation. Okay? So you can identify a few people around you, maybe three or four people, and you can go ahead and take a few moments to pray together, and then I will come back and close us. Thank <laughs> you. 
Father God, we thank you for, again, the time to come together to worship, um, especially as we're in worship as family month. We thank you for um, the great variety of ages represented in our church and even in our congregation as well. And um, we thank you for the, the way that you work through people at different ages and different stages of life and how we can learn from each other. And I pray that um, we would be especially attuned to that this month and, and going forward as well, that um, each part of us brings is part of your body, um, the body of Christ, and that we together make up the body of Christ and that we all need each other, we're dependent on one another, and that together we can glorify you. Um, and so, Father, we pray that we would do that. We pray that our gifts that we give as offerings would be pleasing to you and that they would be used to glorify your name in our church, our city, and our world. In Jesus' name, amen. We do not have offering boxes at the back of these. This sanctuary because it's a rec room and not a sanctuary, um, but there are offering boxes at the back of the two regular san sanctuaries that you can still deposit your gifts there after the service. Um, I'm Kristen, again welcome, thank you for worshiping with us today. As you've seen, August is our worship as a family month and so all the children are welcome to stay and worship with their parents if they'd like or there is Sunday school starting after the children's message each time. So we're going to be doing this for the rest of the month of August. Um, the nursery is not going to be staffed in order to give our nursery workers a break, but it is open for parents who want to go and stay with their own little ones, um, I think ages two and under, for the nursery. Um, also, we do need more space in August because we have families joining us with kids, so as you come in, if you can kind of sit closer to the front in the future, I'm not going to make you move right now. We've deemed that we're okay for today. but. Next time, uh, as you come in, if you can think of just trying to fill in a little bit closer to the front um, when you come in, then uh, that will leave room for others to come in a little bit later. Um, also, we do not have Sunday school during the second hour to give our teachers a break and have, let them have some fellowship time with us and with their families. So no second hour Sunday school for anyone during the month of August. We'll resume again in September. But coffee should be available in the foyer and you can enjoy hanging out with everybody and not have to rush off to anything else. So please join us for that after service. We have two scripture memory verses. We have our memory verse for the year, which is Colossians 1, 28 through 29. So if you'd go ahead and stand, it is also in your bulletin, but it's on the screen as well. Um, and let's go ahead and recite this together. Colossians 1, 28 through 29. Him we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone of all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, and he is all the world's And then our quarter three memory verse is Matthew 25 40. Go ahead and recite that with me as well. And the meaning will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the can remain standing as I'll read the passage for us today. Um, longtime T4C member Stephen Kong is preaching, and he's preaching out of Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3, and also verse 6 that Mo already read for us this morning. I'll go ahead and read them, but you can remain standing. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. 
By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And then verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You may be seated. Can everyone hear me in the back? Can you hear me? No. Okay. Well, I thank God for the privilege to speak to you this morning. Uh, what I open is the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for each day you give us and each breath we take. Thank you for this morning when we come together and worship as a family. I pray you may speak to each one of us through your word and open our eyes and see a wonderful handiwork in this world. Okay, so today I'll be talking about Certainly in this short time, I cannot cover everything. So I hope I make it enjoyable and fun by sharing a few things that I find compelling as a physicist, and hopefully you do too. And to get started and to break the ice, I'd like to share with you how I became a physicist. And let's start all the way back to my elementary school days. This is my fifth grade report card. If you look closely, it's not impressive. There are five C's, including a C minus. So I almost got a D. <laughs> you may be wondering how I ended up becoming a physicist. Well, when I was in junior high, things changed. And the main thing that changed was that I began to enjoy learning. I found math and science fascinating, and that helped me to do better in school overall. Now this report card, I did get A's in math and science, so certainly that was a strength for me, even in fifth grade. And since I enjoyed and excelled in math and science, I ended up attending Caltech for my college education. However, I had a hard time trying to figure out what to major in. You know, I was interested in physics because I enjoyed learning about the laws of nature, but also knew it would be easier to find a job with an engineering degree. <laughs> well, it was not until my sophomore year that I finally made the decision to choose physics. And after graduating from Caltech, I got a PhD in physics at, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I thank God that I was able to find jobs as a physicist. And I have truly enjoyed using math and physics at work almost every day. I'm also thankful that I, as I learned more and more about the universe as a physicist, it helped me as a Christian to stand firm in believing in the existence of God. Is it going in and out? Or, okay. But before we talk about the existence of God, I'd like to take a step back and ask the question, who cares? Why should we care if God exists? It may be a, a great philosophical question, but does it really matter? And I believe 
Uh, the verse Hebrews 11.6 helps to answer this question. This is a key verse that I'll be preaching from today and next week. And it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You can see here that believing that God exists is only the first step. And if we stop there, then whether God exists just becomes a philosophical question. Therefore, the second step is critical. The second step is believing that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And you may ask yourself, what kind of reward are we talking about here? Do you want a nice new house? Do you want a great career? Do you want a loving family? Well, while these are all fine things, I don't believe these are the kind of rewards that this verse is talking about. You know, if you're seeking something, what is your reward? Isn't it finding what you seek? What makes the most sense is that the reward is God himself. Therefore, what is very profound about this verse is that God is more than just a creator God. He wants to seek him and find him. And according to the Bible, the reason why is because he created us to have a loving relationship with him. However, unless we believe that God wants to be found and wants to love us, it may be hard to take the second step. And I will cover this second step next week when I talk about evidence for loving God. Today, I'll focus on the first step, believing that God exists. And more specifically, believing in a creator God. And I say creator, creator God because this is the emphasis in verse 3, which says, by faith we understand the universe was formed by God's command. You know, keep in mind that one can believe in a God that created the universe without believing that this God is loving. Therefore, believing in a creator God is the first step. I'm not necessarily saying that everyone goes through these two steps. You know, for some people, they may skip the first step and believe in the existence of a loving God right away. However, I find it instructive to break it up into these two parts. And Romans 1.20 is a verse that is helpful for taking the first step of believing in a creator God. And it says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what was made, so people are without excuse. You know, what this verse tells us is that we can learn about God and his existence by studying nature. And we can do this by simply taking a walk in nature. However, we can also do this more thoroughly by studying nature very closely as scientists do. I'll let you handle the nature walk. Today, this morning, we'll examine nature as a physicist. I'm not saying we can de definitively prove God's existence, but I believe the evidence is strong enough that believing in the existence of God is reasonable. Even Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein believe in the existence of God. And therefore, the main point I'll make this morning is this. It is reasonable to believe in the existence of the creator God. And to make this point, I will share with you some of my thoughts on the evidence I see in physics for God's existence, which has helped me to stand firm on this first step of faith. And I hope what I share with you this morning can help you stand firm if you're ready to believe, or to help you believe if you have not yet believed. And don't worry, I will not use any math beyond fifth grade. <laughs> I will also start with kindergarten level physics and work my way up from there. And while I'll try to keep it understandable, I will require you to use your imagination. Keep in mind that you do not need to understand everything to understand the main points. So let's learn some physics. I'll start by giving you a basic explanation of what physics is by talking about what physicists do. You know, one way to understand what, what a physicist does is to compare them with lawyers. In some sense, physicists are like lawyers. They both 
deal with laws. Lawyers govern, study laws that govern society, while physicists study laws that govern the material universe. And if I were to ask a lawyer to give me every law in the world, it would be straightforward for them to do so because they are all written down somewhere. Now if I asked a physicist to give me all the laws in the universe, how would that physicist get them to me? Nothing was initially written down for the physicist. There's, there's not a great stone tablet somewhere with all the laws of physics. You see, the lawyers had it easy. <laughs> <laughs> the physicists through the ages had to figure out what the laws of physics were by observing how things behave. And it took a long, long time, and they still are not done. The ultimate goal of physicists is to figure out all the laws that govern the material universe. In addition, physicists want to accomplish this with the fewest number of laws. Well, to help you understand physics and how physicists figure out these laws, I'm going to use traffic laws as an illustration. That's why I have all these signs here because they are somewhat similar to the laws of physics. But traffic laws are much, much easier to understand. Traffic laws govern how motor vehicles can move around. When you come to a red light, you stop. When the light turns green, you go. When there's a one-way sign, you make sure you're going the right direction. Don't you just love traffic laws? They're very easy to understand. Similarly, the laws of physics govern how material bodies can move around. Unfortunately, they are, in general, much more difficult to understand. However, there are some simple examples. There is a speed limit in the universe. It is much higher than 55 miles per hour. It is 670 million miles per hour. This is the speed limit of the universe. It is also the speed of light. Nothing can go faster than light. Also, you cannot do a U-turn and go backwards in time. Except, of course, in Hollywood, where they break the laws of physics on a daily basis, <laughs> including the speed limit. So how do physicists figure out these laws? Well, to help you understand how physicists figure out these laws, I need to now to use your imagination. Okay, so imagine you are in a totally foreign country where you do not know the traffic laws and you cannot recognize any of the traffic signs. You do not even see a typical shape and color combination you are familiar with familiar with, like red octagon for a stop sign. At this point, you decide to figure out the traffic laws by watching cars. And you imagine you see this sign at an intersection. You sit at this intersection, watching cars pass by for a while. The first four cars you see stop at the sign. And you say to yourself, ha-ha, this must be a stop sign. However, the next two cars don't stop. <laughs> As several more cars pass by, you realize cars stop if there's another car crossing, otherwise they just slow down. And you then conclude this must be a yield sign. And to make sure you are right, you go to several different intersections that have the same sign and see if you see the same behavior, and you do. You cannot, you continue to figure out uh, let's see. You can, so and you continue to figure out other signs and traffic laws in this manner. And after months and months of study, you should be able to write a reasonable traffic law for, for this place. And this is similar to what physicists do to figure out the laws of physics that govern the universe. You know, physicists patiently sit at the intersections of the universe observing day after day how things move or behave, and then try to deduce what laws are being obeyed. Well, it is now time for some simple experiments. 
we can all be physicists this morning. I'll be asking you questions, so feel, feel free to answer. And we'll start with kindergarten level physics. So I have a ball here. If I let go of the ball, what would happen? Raise your hand if you think it would stay put and float in midair. Raise your hand if you think it would go up. Raise your hand if you think it's going to go to my right. Raise your hand if you think it's going to go down. Okay. Most people think it's going to go down. Well, let me do the experiment and see. What do you know? It went down. Give yourself a pat on the back. You are right. Well, let's uh, try it again. Maybe I got lucky. Oh, it went down again. So what if I did this a thousand times? Now, we, we don't have the time to do this a thousand times. But take my word for it. It'll go down every single time. So, how about if I drop it over here? You know, maybe over there it was special. Oh, it drops here too. So you can see that every time I dropped the ball, it went down. Therefore, gravity is like a one-way sign pointing down. So this is nothing new to you, because ever since you were babies, you all have experimented with gravity. In this sense, you're all amateur physicists. And since gravity is something you are familiar with, and I do not have a lot of time, I will mainly talk about gravity today. However, you'll find that there's a lot more to gravity than you realize. So now I'll continue with a harder experiment. I have two balls, two steel balls here. One is much heavier than the other. So if I were to drop these two balls, what do you think would happen? Which would fall faster? How many of you think the heavier ball is going to fall faster? How many think the lighter ball will fall faster? How many of you think the ball fall about the same speed. They'll hit the table about the same time. Okay, most people believe that. But let's do the experiment and see if they hit the table about the same time. So most people got it right. And the thing is, is that it turns out it doesn't matter how heavy the balls are, they all fall at the same rate. However, it may not be true for different materials. Let's try instead a feather and a small ball. So how many of you think the feather will hit the table first? How many think the small ball will hit the table first? How many think it will hit the table about the same time? Okay, let's see. <laughs> I think the fan is blowing over. <laughs> okay, so clearly the small ball hit the table first. But you can see the feather is being impacted by the air. The air is holding up and the fan is blowing it over. So if we really want to do this experiment properly, we should remove all the air in this room. Uh, however, I don't have a way of doing that, and you won't want me to do that anyway. <laughs> Therefore, I will tell you the answer. The feather and the ball would hit the table at the same time if there's no air. Let me get back over here.
Now Galileo was the first to prove this in the late 1500s. And to do this, he did many experiments. The most famous is dropping iron balls at different weights from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He also measured the acceleration due to gravity to be about 9.8 meters per second squared. And that works out to be about 0 to 60 miles per hour in 3 seconds. So let us move on to the next breakthrough in the understanding of gravity. And this occurred about 100 years later in the late 1600s when Sir Isaac Newton unveiled his universal law of gravity ex as expressed by this equation. Now this was a stunning breakthrough because with this equation, Newton proved that the law of gravity that causes balls to fall to the ground on Earth is the same law that causes the planet to orbit the sun and the moon to orbit the Earth. And furthermore, he was able to calculate the orbits. And the icy on the cake is that Newton also proved that the tides on Earth were caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. Well, let us briefly examine this equation. Now, this equation tells us there's a gravitational force between every two objects. And this equation only requires fifth grade math to calculate it. But you have to keep in mind that physics equations uses letters to represent numbers. And when two letters are next to each other, that means the numbers are multiplied. For example, there's a gravitational force between this ball and this ball. And to calculate the gravitational force, I will multiply the mass of this ball in kilograms and this ball in kilograms and divide twice by the distance between the centers of the balls in meters. And I would then multiply this value by the gravitational constant g. Now g is an extremely small number, so gravity is extremely weak. And that's why I cannot feel any gravitational pull between these two balls. Now the gravitational force between this ball and the Earth I can feel because the mass of the Earth is extremely large. Even so, I am much stronger than the Earth's pull on this ball, as you can see. Now, from the time of Newton, it took over 200 years before the next breakthrough in the understanding of gravity. Care to guess which physicist made that breakthrough? Any guesses? It was Albert Einstein's theory of relativity that totally revolutionized the understanding of gravity. Now, this is, does not mean Newton's equations are no longer useful. It is mainly when gravity is very strong that you need Einstein's equations. And let me explain. To do so, I need you to use your imagination again. Imagine I can change the mass of the Earth. As I increase the mass, the gravitational pull by the Earth becomes stronger and stronger. And imagine the balls falling to the ground faster and faster. And according to Einstein, there's a point where gravity becomes so strong that even light would fall to the ground. So I have a flashlight here. As I shine the light, you can see it just goes straight out of the flashlight and hits the wall. It doesn't fall to the ground. Imagine I now increase the mass of the Earth to the point light falls. Imagine you see light coming straight on my flashlight and then curve down and hit the ground. Well, at this point, we would have created a black hole. <laughs> black holes are created when a, a black hole is black because its gravity is so strong that it causes light to fall in and keeps it from coming back out. Black holes are created when a very large star dies and collapses. The gravity becomes so intense that it causes all the mass to be compressed into a ball 
that is much smaller than its original size, which further increases gravity to the point it becomes a black hole. Now, physics is quite strange near a black hole. Time slows down, and the space-time continuum is highly warped. And as you can imagine, the math becomes much more complex than a basic math of Newton's law of gravity. Now here is the main textbook on Einstein's theory of gravity. I have it here. You may think that this must be it. This book must say everything you're certain know about gravity. And you would be wrong. And I'll show you why. So, so I need you to, to use your imagination again. Imagine I could shrink the Earth without decreasing the mass. So I'm just shrinking it, but the mass stays the same. Imagine I shrink it down to the size of a molecule. A molecule with the mass of the Earth. When things are very small, Newton's laws do not work anymore. You need to use quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the physics of the very small. It's the physics of atoms and molecules. And I'll give you a quick illustration to give you a glimpse of what quantum mechanics is about. So look at this picture. The iguana looks very sharp. When I zoom in, you can see more details. When I zoom in even more, you can see even more details. However, if I zoom in too much, you start to see the individual pixels and you no longer see any more detail. The universe is like that. If you were to zoom in too much, things start to get fuzzy and in some sense pixelated. And there's a physics constant called Planck's constant that controls the degree of fuzziness. Quantum mechanics is a physics that deals with the fuzziness of the universe. So let's go back to this tiny Earth, the size of a molecule. Therefore, the physics of this Earth, the size of a molecule, requires quantum mechanics. However, because it also very, would have very strong gravity, it would require Einstein's equations too. And the field of physics is called quantum gravity. This is the frontier of gravitational physics, and it's not fully understood. And you may be wondering, what physics problem would need quantum gravity? And we don't have any planets or black holes the size of molecules in the universe. However, a long, long time ago, the universe was extremely tiny. It is a time right after the Big Bang. According to physicists, the universe came into existence between 10 and 20 billion years ago through a Big Bang. And according to, um, and before the Big Bang, there was absolutely nothing. Not even space or time. Out of nothing, the universe appeared as a very tiny speck, and time started ticking. And as time proceeded, the universe expanded rapidly and became bigger and bigger to the point where the universe was vast. However, in a time right after the Big Bang, the entire mass of the universe was confined to a tiny, tiny spot. Therefore, the physics at this stage of the universe requires quantum gravity. And since the theory of quantum gravity has not been fully developed, physicists do not fully understand the very early stages of the universe. Phew. We have now followed the development of the laws of gravity from the time of Galileo to the present time. Don't worry if you did not follow everything. However, hope you got a glimpse and how amazing and elegant the universe is. You can also see that our universe is a brilliantly ordered universe, governed by laws as far as we know, have not changed since the beginning of time, and are the same everywhere. Aren't the laws that govern the universe all inspiring? 
Therefore, this begs the question, where do the laws of physics come from? Well, let us ask an easier question first. Where do traffic laws come from? Traffic laws come from the government. In other words, laws suggest there's a governing authority that established them. Therefore, a reasonable answer is that a creator God is the governing authority that established the laws that govern the universe. And Hebrews 11.3, which we read earlier, says it well. By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command. God's command, by definition, is law. When God spoke, the universe came into being. Of course, the laws of physics do not definitively prove the existence of God. However, it gives, does give compelling evidence. And it therefore shows that it's reasonable to believe in the existence of a creator God. And this is the main point I set out to make. And before I close, I'd like to share one additional piece of evidence that drives home this point even further. And will also set the stage for next week's sermon. We saw how the gravitational constant G determines the strength of gravity. There are also many other physical constants that control other properties of the universe, including the speed of light and the fuzziness of the universe, which I talked about too. Now these constants are very important. However, physicists can only measure these constants. They have no idea how the values came to be. And the amazing thing is that it makes a huge difference what these values are set to. And to some extent, this is not surprising. It certainly matters for traffic laws. Would you want the speed limit for the residential street in front of your house to be 60 miles per hour? Of course not. It would cause numerous accidents, which defeats the purpose of having traffic laws. But what if it was set to 5 miles per hour? Well, it would be very safe but not very practical. Therefore, the settings for our traffic laws are chosen to help preserve life while facil facilitating efficient travel. Similarly, the settings of the universe was set in a way that allows for life to occur in our universe. For instance, if the gravitational constant was set too low, the universe after the Big Bang would expand too fast for stars and planets to form so that life would not be possible. On the other hand, if the gravitational constant was set too high, the universe after the Big Bang would expand too slow and collapse before stars and planets came into existence and again, life would not be possible. The gravitational constant needs to be just right for life to occur. It cannot be a tiny bit higher, and it cannot be a tiny bit lower. It is surprising how precisely the physical constants need to be set. They are much more sensitive than the settings for traffic laws. This extreme sensitivity on the physical constant for life to be possible is called the fine-tuning of the universe. And you may wonder, do physicists really believe this? Well, when I attended my third year class reunion at Caltech, the Caltech physics professor gave a lecture on fine-tuning. Yes, at Caltech reunions, we have a whole lineup of lectures on science. <laughs> From this lecture, it was clear that physicists believe that the physical constants are exactly what they need to be to allow for life. And he says that physicists do not understand why, but that it is possible that some unknown physical laws would determine the values of some of these constants. Well, whether these unknown physics laws exist do, do not really matter. Either way, our universe appears to be designed for life. This not only makes the evidence for a creator God even more compelling, but also begs the question, why was the universe designed for life? This question goes beyond the field of science, and in essence, it's asking why are we even here to begin with in this vast cosmos? In other words, what is the meaning of life? I will address these questions next week when I present evidence for a loving God. Let us pray. Father God, we 
humble ourselves before you. You give evidence of your existence and your character and the beauty and wonder of the universe. From inside every atom to the numerous galaxies in the universe, we see the beauty, majesty, and elegance of what you have created. While it's reasonable to believe you created the universe, you still need to take a step of faith to believe. May you give us that faith to take that step and to stand fast and believe. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Um, we're going to be taking communion now, um, and that's kind of the amazing thing about you know learning about all this stuff that can seem really overwhelming. Uh, our, our God is a creator because he wants to have a relationship with his creation, and the most explicit way we know this is Jesus, uh, as God, became human and died for us and, and rose again so that we could have eternal life with him. And so that's why we have... Uh, this communion time to remember that really important event that happened 2,000 years ago. Uh, so the Apostle Paul reminds us that before we take communion, we should uh, really humble ourselves, remember um, who we are, who he is, and also confess uh, our sins to him. And, and he also encourages us that if there's a confession that we need to make to someone else, that we should do that too. So I'm going to give you guys uh, a, a minute to kind of do some business with God, and after that, um, we will take communion together. invite all those who are baptized Christians to, uh, to partake in communion with us. And so we're going to be doing it a little bit different that we, differently than we have in the past. So uh, if uh, you are not going to be taking communion with us, as the ushers bring the plates along, uh, you can just let the plate go by you. Uh, and please wait to take communion until we're all ready together. All right, so the ushers are going to be handing out the elements right now.
I can get the, the bread out. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Get the juice ready. You said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much that you are our creator. Um, you have created us. You have created us not just for us to um, be on our own, but that you want to have a relationship with us. And thank you for sending your son to die for our sins and to give us life through your resurrection. So thank you, Lord, and we want to praise you for that. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Please rise for a song of response. I want to see some movement. I got my tambourine. <laughs> Time to party. This is going to be a little bit more of an exciting song, so if you feel called to move, if you feel called to dance, please do so. We'll be getting jiggy with it up here, so feel free to join us.
Amen. And I'll close with the benediction. You create us to have life. And for in Romans, we, uh, you say in Paul, uh, Paul says from for, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that is the end. So go get some coffee. <laughs>